the New World Order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a titan myth, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligent, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's live edition. It is May 7th, 2013. And tonight, for at least hour one, and maybe perhaps a part of hour two, I am joined by a very special guest. Now, you've heard me mention him on air multiple times, and I am glad to be able to bring him to you live tonight. So, because the, sh the first segment here is quick and short, I want to introduce him, uh, and then when we come back in from break and we get into the nice long segment, I'll have him uh, get into uh, more about his background and stuff. But really quick, before we go to break, let me introduce tonight's guest, Professor James Tracy. What's up, Professor? Uh, well, not too much. It's a, um, a nice, uh, beautiful Tuesday night here in South Florida, and I'm happy to be on with you. Uh, I, I got to say, first and foremost, thank you uh, for everything that you do. I, I know, uh, you know, from talking to you off air and stuff many a times and interviewing you in the past, I know what you've uh, been through. Uh, and uh, the, the the crap and drama, at the very least, that you've had to put up with for having the courage to speak out. And in academia, uh, people like you, professors like yourself, are few and far between. So right off the bat, before we get into anything, I want to give you a big thank you uh, for what you do, Professor, because it takes a brass set of balls to, to talk the way you do in college. It really does. Well, thanks very much. And I must also uh, preface our conversation uh, by saying that uh, you know I'm speaking as a uh, as a private citizen, and of course I think it's uh, my uh, name and the title professor are perhaps to some degree inseparable. That's what the you know most of the media generally reference me as as being a professor. But of course I am speaking as a uh, as a citizen. Of course you know at the same time a lot of what I um, a lot of what I look at uh, a lot of what I do study. Uh, is is also in, involved in what I what I comment on and what I blog about. But one of the things that's gotten me in, into some trouble uh, is uh, you know addressing these uh, these issues uh, and uh, and bringing the university's name into the uh, in, into the discussion. And again, you did so a, a, as a free citizen, a a, a you know a, a someone who's. Last time I checked, according to the Constitution, you did have your First Amendment right to free speech. But we'll get into that more on the other side of the break. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We will be right back with tonight's guest, Professor James Tracy. Don't go anywhere. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, as I said, going into the break, you should have your First Amendment right to free speech. And uh, Professor Tracy should have the right to talk about what he wants in his off time. 
on his personal blog and not get harassed for it. And if you don't know what Professor Tracy had the gall, the nerve to do, was after the Sandy Hook massacre, he went out and he gathered up. He didn't even make any presumptions. He just gathered up all the the strange evidence that was laying out there in front of everybody, and he pretty much commented on it and just said, this is what it is. And he was attacked for that by Anderson Cooper and, you know, on the radio show hosts here and there. Uh, I heard one of the local DJs down here uh, make a comment to uh, the, the quote-unquote moron FAU professor. And I tore that guy apart later on that night, so you don't have to worry about that, professor. Um, you know, I've taken on your detractors pretty well because uh, I know you. Uh, and I've seen you do, I've actually seen you teach. I've, I've seen your, uh, one of your classes. Uh, you're not an idiot. You're not a jihadist, you know, crazy person or anything like that. You are an everyday, down-to-earth individual who, who happens to be a college professor and had the balls to say, hey, you know, there's something weird going here. And regardless of my profession aside, I, as a free uh, American, see something and, I, hey, aren't you supposed to see something and say something? Right, professor? And that's what you did. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you see something that's, that's blatantly wrong. Uh, what looks to be in some ways a, uh, a stage production. And I think that that dynamic of uh, Newtown of Sandy Hook is further highlighted uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Boston uh, Marathon bombing that we can get to a little bit later. But I think that these things, these two things are related in a number of ways. But, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the public uh, generally look at, um, they experience the world. Uh, most all of the news and information that they obtain is not uh, through first-hand experience, but rather through the media. Uh, so they're heavily reliant on these major, you know, transnational corporations that own the media, that own what they, you know, uh, have control over what they see, what they hear, and uh, they um, they don't really question uh, what the um, the more intricate power dynamics are of, of these types of relationships. So again, they're very very dependent. And uh, that's, uh, that's very unfortunate. We're not just talking about, you know, uh, children or adolescents. We're talking about adults who in many ways behave like children or adolescents when it comes to the deference to authority, when it comes defer you know, to uh, a deference to the, uh, the anchor person on the, uh, on the television or the, uh, the other uh, uh, sort of person that might have a, a certain degree of, uh, of perceived expertise or credentials. And, um, you know, that, that also is kind of... Uh, it illustrates my situation as well because uh, credentialed individuals are not supposed to uh, talk about events like this. Right? We're supposed to, if anything, either be quiet or uh, uphold, uh, you know, somehow um, uh, in, in, in a forthright way, uphold the dominant uh, narrative, the official narrative, what, uh, what have we've been told to believe, to not question that. Any sort of society, I think, that has uh, institutions that dole out particular types of degrees of uh, specific professional expertise are inherently authoritarian to one degree or another. So when you have a, um, you know, again, a professor such as myself or some other person with a certain degree of expert expertise in, in an area uh, come out and say, wait a minute, you know, the emperor doesn't have any clothes, something's really wrong here, there's a... Um, there's a cause for serious alarm. You know, the idea that uh, someone who, who does, have these, um, does have these titles is speaking out. Uh, that's just something that's unacceptable. And so I think that that is uh, what largely uh, prompted the major media to come out in a very concerted and very, in a very coordinated way to come out and attack me as they did, as we saw for you know several days in January, uh, and uh, and to call for you know essentially call for my uh, dismissal. Now that wasn't that wasn't said in in those words. It wasn't said that explicitly, but there was a real campaign. It was implied. Yes, it was implied, and uh, it was either it was either um, shut up. Uh, or, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't be teaching, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, you shouldn't have your position. Uh, and um, it gives you an idea of, um, 
I think it, it, it also sets an example for those that might be inclined to speak out or might be thinking about it, who may be educators or, uh, you know, other sorts of professionals. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it makes them, it gives them pause. Should I really, uh, should I really do that? Do I really want to go through the sort of, um, you know, the ordeal that he went through? Uh, and with most most individuals, they don't even really need that kind of um, you know uh, those scare tactics. They generally, you know, there aren't many academics that really do examine controversial topics anyway. So I think the powers that be in that regard don't have many challenges. They don't have to worry about an awful lot uh, because even those that have this degree of training and and believe that they are uh, you know intellectually sophisticated, and in some ways they are. Uh, but they're not inclined to actually take public stances, and that's you know that's unfortunate. And I think that that is in, in part uh, the cause of uh, the present sort of situation that we that we find ourselves in. I agree. And then when someone does have the courage to open their mouth, like you said, they're skewered uh, as if uh, you know they were the antichrist. And uh, you know, I, I find it uh, when they went after you, in particular, uh, Anderson Cooper's little hit piece on you. Uh, and, and when I, I debunked, I actually spent a whole show where I spent two hours just debunking the whole thing, the whole attack on you. But Cooper uh, made an interesting comment. He said, "Well, I, I find it funny that a professor who teaches, uh, you know, media studies, you know, or, or or that's his area of expertise, you know, like media, uh, uh, he wouldn't want to talk to the press. Um, of course, he wouldn't want to talk to the press. He he studies you idiots. He knows how you're going to work. He's smarter than that." You know, it wasn't like you were coward, a coward, or you were chicken or anything like that. You were being, you were being smart. In fact, I even talked to you about this. There was no reason to walk into that trap because all they would have done was set you up and skewer you, and then it would have been video clips all over. That that would have been one video clip that they made sure went viral. I can guarantee you. Yeah, m most likely. I think that's what they were actually looking for. But that's you know, even like the local news media. Uh, when they show up and do a five or ten minute interview, you know, they only use about 20 seconds or maybe 30, 45 seconds. It's not very much uh, of what overall, you know, most of it's on the cutting room floor, so to speak, or the digital cutting room floor. CNN is, uh, it's a very sophisticated operation. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, there are elements of, uh, you know, individuals who have expertise in psychological warfare on staff there. We know that Anderson Cooper, for example, is uh, CIA or former CIA. He spent a couple of summers uh, out, of, uh, out of Yale uh, uh, interning for the CIA. After his graduation from Yale, he went and made his way to Burma and posed as a journalist and infiltrated uh, student uh, student groups, student activist groups in uh, in Burma, and from there he went to uh, Vietnam and Somalia and so forth. So, uh, this is an individual with an intelligence background, right? Uh, and um, and he's you know he he's not the only one, <laughs> in, you know, in broadcasting and and cable casting and and what have you. But uh, he's one of the ones that uh, we can clearly document that does have those. Those sorts of uh, sorts of ties, and uh, you know, this is something that just that that much aside, uh, the uh, broadcasters, the major media in this country had a significant investment in Sandy Hook and this Newtown narrative because they're the ones that created it. You know, they're the ones that that delivered it to the public, and uh, so the idea of someone questioning this, the idea of someone arguing that it is that it is at least uh, has staged elements or characteristics uh, are, are staged uh, that is uh, that's an attack on them as well so I think that is uh, partly why uh, they came out with such force uh, to uh, to silence me to uh, to intimidate me to frighten me uh, and uh, you know uh, with um, with the possible repercussions uh, and uh, and the like and you know, I, I must admit that to some degree, I think that they were, you know, they were successful. I said to myself, "My God, I mean, this is what have I gotten myself into here?" And uh, and you know that they did uh, come out. Uh, there were some stories that came that uh, were published since my commentaries on the Boston bombing uh, as well. But uh, it is a uh, it, it's uh, something that is. Um, Definitely an experience to be in that uh, under that degree of scrutiny, 
uh, you know, the event itself had only taken place a few weeks prior, uh, and uh, it had a very clear uh, impact uh, and on, on on the public of this country, and they had an emotional investment to this uh, to this event, given its tragic proportions. And so, the notion of someone coming along and saying, "Wait a minute." How do we know that uh, you know this took place as we are being told? Is very disturbing because that's something that also calls their reality into question, and that's something that's that's uh, that makes one very uncomfortable, right? What do you mean that uh, what I saw is not what I saw, right? What do you mean my team didn't uh, you know didn't win or didn't lose? I I, I experienced this. I experienced this through the media, uh, and uh, people. Uh, Believe that um, you know that the media will be um, honest, will be truthful uh, and forthright to them. So you're 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 calling into question people's people's bearings, uh, how they how they perceive their world, and so that's part of it as well. You know, a, a significant amount of it had to deal with the had to do with the the incident, the nature of the incident, the idea of there being this you know this terrible shooting. But part of it also was um, was the uh, the questioning of that reality that had been created for them uh, by the uh, by the media, regardless of the extent to which it actually took place. We know there you know there are a number of narratives. I think some of some of which were actually contrived in order to um, to get you know to get independent uh, researchers and so forth off the beaten track. These were red herrings uh, as well. But regardless of, of, of what one takes away, uh, it, um, the majority of the population simply accepted this, and uh, and the idea of someone coming along and saying, "Well, we, we don't know what took place," is um, is very unnerving. Uh, and yet, it, it's um, <laughs> it's interesting actually, given the when you look at the overall event and the way in which it was covered, it I, I find it somewhat disturbing that there weren't more people. Who were uh, who, who were questioning it, uh, and yet uh, that that was not the case. Well, that event, and people like yourself and others who uh, called out and said, "Hey, you know, there could be uh, crisis actors and stuff," which we'll get into because we're we're coming up to a break in about a minute and a half. But we'll get into that on the other side uh, a little bit because I, there's I have an interesting uh, personal anecdote about that myself, uh, but. Uh, you know, back when Sandy Hook happened six months ago, there were a lot of people that saw some of the red flags and said, "Okay, maybe, you know, they, they, maybe they didn't. You know, it wasn't completely faked. Like, you know, so, some of the like you said, the red herring stuff, where oh my God, every single aspect of it is not true, and oh my God, everybody's a Hollywood actor, and it's they had this actor involved, and that kind of stuff is a red herring to take you away from the fact that yeah, they actually do use things called crisis actors, which." involve real amputees dressing up like people that did lose limbs and stuff like that but uh, we can get into that it, the, the the whole point uh, of this is that six months ago more people were asleep but because of your work and other people's work pointing these things out when Boston happened immediately there was a, 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 a much uh, better coordinated we'll say a response to it from the alternative media as there was opposed to when the Sandy Hook shooting happened. Uh, there was less disinfo coming out and more focus on keeping their eye on the ball. So uh, I think the independent media is learning from this, but I also think that because of the independent media's rise, the powers that shouldn't be are learning how to be manipulate our news cycle just like they manipulate the rain, the regular mainstream media news cycle. And with that, I'm going to pause it because we're coming up to the break. Ladies and gentlemen, do not go anywhere. More with Professor Tracy when we get back. Stay tuned. So, six months ago when Newtown happened, as I said, I don't think people were... I mean, people were receptive to, to the independent alternative information, but at the time, there was so much stuff going around, and I even chastised... Uh, the independent alternative media that, uh, you know, certain people jumped on things too fast and it's not going to bode well for us. They're going to use that against us, blah, blah, blah. It's almost, and to me, it looked like they were playing us to a certain extent because they had learned how to manipulate our news cycle. And I'm glad that I'm not the only person that paid attention to that because with this, six months later, that Boston happens and you see people 
uh, you see the independent alternative media learning from their mistakes as well. And that's important because these, like you said, you see, that's a real, that's why I wanted to focus on this for a second, Professor, because you brought up a really good point. They're learning how to manipulate us. They really are. They're learning how to put out disinfo or, you know, red herring type crap to get the alternative media uh, to run down one of these paths and not pay attention. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the nature of the two events uh, um, is very different as well because with uh, Sandy Hook, uh, we, the, the whole thing allegedly transpired, um, you know, out of public view. And so we didn't really, you know, know what exactly took place. We still don't. I mean, there, the crime scene is, uh, is, is not um, open for uh, public scrutiny by the press or, uh, you know, any private citizens. Uh, and uh, with, with, in contrast, Boston, uh, something that uh, took place uh, in broad daylight, and I think that uh, those that um, coordinated and orchestrated that event uh, did so, um, you know, <laughs> in, in broad daylight, you know. Uh, they did so in, in such a way that um, there was a, um, an abundance of uh, photographic and uh, video documentation. I'm not sure as to whether or not all of that was really uh, anticipated with, for example, surveillance uh, photos and uh, CCTV and the, and the like, um, but nevertheless, you know that that I think has, I, I believe that that is something that has provided for um, those that might otherwise be more skeptical to be less so, uh, because we see uh, this event actually uh, transpiring before our eyes uh, through this um, through this evidence. In fact, you know, I, I, it just came to my attention this evening that. Um, there is a um, uh, cell phone video that was taken like within about 20, 15, 20 feet of the initial blast uh, at the finish line. And uh, that is presently uh, something that's being dissected and discussed. Uh, uh, NoDisinfo.com has a, a post on it, and I intend to put one up uh, as well because I think that it's a very important find. Uh, and in fact, I think that website has done an incredible job of actually taking that video apart and analyzing still images from that video. And we see uh, how this, uh, how the um, uh, those involved uh, in the event are uh, getting into position, even more so uh, than with the uh, surveillance uh, video that was uh, taken from. From overhead that I've analyzed uh, on on my site uh, previously. This was a couple of weeks ago, just a week after the event. So uh, this is um, you know this is exciting material, and uh, that has just emerged over the past couple of days by um, Max Malone, uh, who uh, who released this. And um, if you look at the you look at the video, he, he runs it through once at normal speed and then slows it down, but. It, it uh, I think, is really important to go frame by frame and uh, to, to locate some of these uh, key figures uh, in this particular event uh, and, uh, and and how it uh, how it actually went uh, went down. Another thing that I thought was uh, of significance with regard to this video, as I was looking at it tonight, is that uh, if this um, if, if this ordinance were an I an IED, if it were uh, you know the, um, the the pressure cooker bomb that uh, the authorities claim it to be uh, that was as uh, as 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 lethal uh, and as as injurious as uh, uh, it, it purportedly was. Then uh, the people in the in this video, at least some of them, would have also been counted among the casualties. And uh, yet there is no discernible um, bloodshed or anything of the like. Uh, that's uh, evident uh, among these these individuals. Professor, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this right there, but I want you to hold that thought. We're coming up to a quick break, and then we got a nice long segment. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Professor James Tracy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Nice long segment, and uh, going to the break, Professor Tracy was bringing up a really good point. He was saying that 
uh, you know, the bomb going off, you would ex- you first of all, you would expect there to be more casualties, uh, pretty much. And you know what? I, I've brought that up in previous broadcasts, uh, Jim. I said, you know, this it just it looked more of um, like a movie prop, like something you'd see in uh, training when we were in the military. They would they would do things like that. It was something to me. It looked uh, more like that than something you would expect a terrorist. You know, wanting to cause death and destruction because if you've ever seen, you can just go on YouTube and look up pressure cooker bomb, and and because they because that was they they were trying to say it's just like Al Qaeda you and the Taliban <laughs> use in in Afghanistan and I'm like no it's not they use C4 you should see look at the shock wave that thing creates and if you watch the video you'll see the shock wave travel across the ground you didn't see that at that event I mean look where that scissor lift was by the first explosion that thing doesn't even rock back and forth. From the explosion, how is that possible? If that if that was you know such a big and I'm not saying people weren't hurt in that vicinity, but I don't think it was. I, I all you need is an explosion, and of course anybody that really is real close, so it could be hurt. But then you you have well placed people in, in the right area, and we'll get into uh, the crisis actors in a bit and stuff and and all that. But I want to get your take on that, and then I have the side trackers for a second. Uh, back to Sandy Hook, and I just want to let the listeners know that Professor Tracy has been gracious. He's going to grant us an extra half hour tonight. He's going to stay till 11.30 with us. So thanks, by the way, Professor, for giving us an extra half hour. So first, go ahead and finish up your thought about what you were saying with the bomb, and then um, I want to ask you something about uh, what happened with Sandy Hook, and then we can go back to Boston. Well, sure, yeah, and, and actually, you might be helpful in this regard as well, as I was thinking on break, Popeye, because you were in the service, and uh, you've gone through this uh, this sort of training and may have seen action, and, uh, you know, uh, with these, uh, you know, types of uh, explosive devices as well, and uh, so understand the nature of them and uh, what, the, what the dangers and, um, you know, what sort of um, carnage they can mete out. But with this uh, video, or rather the, the cell phone video that uh, I was discussing, that was just taken um, several meters away from the uh, from the initial blast at the finish line, uh, one would have uh, likely expected to to, to see uh, people, um, you know, who uh, were injured. Um, bloodshed, uh, people uh, likely on the ground. I mean, we're talking about uh, a number of people that lost limbs, apparently, a number of people that were that were maimed, uh, three people that were killed, two of whom were at the finish line. And so uh, one would expect to, uh, to see uh, a good degree of, uh, of, of carnage as, as a result of the initial blast. And we don't see any of that. Uh, what is experienced, uh, you know, among those that, that the video kind of captures the sounds and the sights of, uh, there is uh, some degree of, of shock, maybe mild to moderate shock, uh, in terms of hearing the blast and, uh, and people beginning to flee when they see the, when they see the smoke. But other than that, uh, there's not a great deal of horror that is evidenced as, um, as a result, so you know, and you were you were talking about the impact, the 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 the, um, the force wave of a of an IED. Uh, one of the indicators of the lack thereof, a uh, lack of any type of um, any type of, of 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 force being emitted from this whatever it was, uh, is the scaffolding along the marathon route. Uh, which is not disturbed at all. It's not perforated by any shrapnel, which the physicians claim uh, is, you know, embedded in, in, in many of the victims. Uh, but we see no no shrapnel that is perforating the scaffolding along the side of the marathon route. Nor is there any um, any force from the uh, ordinance itself that is disturbing the scaffolding in any way, shape, or form. So, uh, with that in mind. Uh, what 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 might be concluded, and I'm not saying that this is is wholly conclusive, but what might be concluded is that these uh, devices were uh, much more benign, that uh, they may have been uh, sound charges, something that you know would, would be on a on a movie set or, as you suggest, in military training, uh, and, and along along with uh, one or more charges that produce a great deal of smoke, and uh, force that smoke upward, uh, more so than anything else. So there's an effect there. Uh, and there is a quite literally a smoke screen 
whereby people may uh, may may get into place, um, uh, and and that might be confusing for those that are you know that are present, uh, but um, little more than that. So um, and they they could have even used real bombs uh, to the point where they they weren't laced with heavy shrapnel. Um, they, they remember they, these guys know what they're doing when they want to stage something, right? I mean, he, he, the spe a special effects guy knows exactly how much explosives he needs for a special effect and everything. So, if and I've I've said this before, uh, I, I find it interesting how there's a high level of wounded people, a high high number of wounded people, and a very very low number of dead people, which with a bomb and horrific injuries, you would expect there to be a higher rate of dead people right and i said on air not that i want more people to be dead right but if if you're gonna set a bomb off let's let's say it let's say it wasn't a a complete movie prop but it was one level up above a movie prop right who would yeah. benefit from doing that obviously not the terrorist because you would think a terrorist would want to kill everybody in the vicinity and if you i mean you're you're a smart guy professor you know if you see a bombing in iraq or a bombing in afghanistan in the marketplace what happens to the people in the general vicinity? They're turned to goo. Yeah. And you didn't, you didn't see that. I mean, you saw a certain level of gore, but almost like uh, movie level of gore, not real bombing level of gore. If you look at the two, if you look at pictures, it just, they look drastically different. And I know people, that's going to piss people off when I say that, but they do. And I'm not saying that people weren't hurt. Uh, they could, they, it could be one level up from a movie prop. But the point is, who would benefit from more injured than dead. Well, the powers that shouldn't be when in six to eight months they're going to use them as political backdrops for some new type of legislation. That's who. And that's the first thing I thought of when I saw how those bombs didn't do what you would... Again, go on YouTube, look up pressure cooker IED in Afghanistan or pressure cooker bomb in Afghanistan and you'll see video after video where they're using some sort of uh, like RDX or C4, you know, and it's that's powerful, and that creates a shock wave. Okay, and you'll see the shock wave travel across the ground. That's meant to take the knees out, take the legs off at the knees, cripple the soldier. Okay, and those bombs, by the way, are not really meant, Jim. A lot of those things. A lot of times, yes, they want to kill, but a lot of times it, that stuff is not. The, the tactic is meant to injure. That way. Uh, if you injure, you slow down the military. See, they, they know that the, the insurgents know that if the, the army or the marines are under fire and one of their guys is killed, they'll just keep returning fire and then bring the body back when they're done. Whereas if the person is injured, three or four of them will stop what they're doing. So that's just that's a, a military style tactic that you, you have from you know insurgents brought over here. Uh, you know, to me, again, that reeks of intelligence agency. Uh, type connections, but I, I know I'm going. I, I'm going way, way, way deep down the rabbit hole. Uh, what say you? Well, um, <laughs> I um, I would tend to, you know, I tend to agree with uh, and uphold, uh, you know, uh, most all of your observations there. Uh, and um, if uh, w one of the things that uh, struck me is really almost comical. Uh, was uh, a few days ago, this was last week now, when uh, the FBI uh, argued that the, the powder the, the, that the, uh, the Zarnev brothers used to create these uh, pressure cooker bombs came from fireworks purchased at Phantom Fireworks, which is a, you know, <laughs> a, a, a Class C common fireworks uh, uh, um, Franchise, right, in the, uh, I believe, the eastern United States, based out of Ohio or what have you. But anyway, they uh, presented a photograph with a, uh, you know, a handful of these, I guess, you know, fountains and some uh, other kinds of, uh, other kinds of things that the, uh, some friends of the Zarniev brothers had apparently disposed of for them. Well, and the, the idea that, um, as you suggest, the the idea that that a, a bomb, uh, uh, two bombs that had the um, capacity to kill uh, three people and injure 264 uh, there at the marathon uh, were created through 
um, these uh, you know these these consumer fireworks. Some of which you could you know purchase you know in Florida you can purchase them right at the supermarket. <laughs> uh, is just preposterous, and yet uh, I think that um, you know the authorities and our media uh, really have a fairly low estimation of the intelligence of much of the American public to be able to say that, to be able to argue that, and, uh, and get away with it uh, without uh, anyone actually really contesting it. Uh, that, uh, that speaks a great deal to their estimation of uh, how, they, how they perceive us. Uh, and they're, they're, they're pretty accurate if you, uh, if you think about it. But then again, not so much. I see, I don't see, everybody sees the whole cheering, you know, the, the people going out, yay, and they were cheering the, the, the cops and everything. I, a lot of people see that as, oh my God, look how stupid these people are. But to be quite honest with you, I think that was more of a, 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 a you know, another part of this whole psyop. Uh, just like the Bin Laden cheering, you know, the, the students outside the White House uh, conveniently partying at when Bin Laden was supposedly killed for you know, the umpteenth time. And it, it, I don't. It didn't look like the whole city was out there. It looked like maybe, at the most, maybe a hundred people, hundred and fifty people. Yeah, and, well, look at. And look with well placed camera shots, you know, you know what I'm saying. Absolutely. Look at uh, the staged event uh, in Baghdad in 2003 of tearing down Saddam Hussein's statue. Uh, how that was really just several dozen people who were there, but the way it was depicted in the media, one would think that there were you know throngs. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of individuals. I watched it live. Oh, yeah. I, I was I was in the military at the time. I remember watching. Uh, they, we had a, a cable feed, and we we saw the the footage. And I remember us even us in the military being like, "Yeah, yeah, we bought it." Uh -huh. And then later on, when I researched it, I was like, "Oh my god, I was totally had." So I mean, yeah. I speak from personal experience. I know, right? You know, I got stung by that. It looked real. Well, the fog of war is uh, is shared by those at home too. Uh, it's you know this sort of intoxication that uh, takes place uh, as a result of the uh, the propaganda that um, that we're fed, and we certainly got a tremendous amount of it there uh, going into going into Iraq in in two thousand three. So and and there was also of course the anticipation that we were going to be greeted as liberators and and everything, and that you know that footage was allegedly confirmation. Of that uh, that sort of uh, prophesying uh, by the neocons, so um, and and you know they I think that they've you know there's no doubt they're they're masters at this they're masters at this type of manipulation and we see that in these types of events in the uh, the Newtown event in the uh, the Boston uh, the Boston bombing both of which at least uh, partially uh, had contrived uh, elements uh, uh, in, in in the presentation so. You said you wanted to go back to the to the uh, the Sandy Hook. Uh, yeah, we're 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 gonna we got about a uh, well we got about uh, forty five seconds before the break comes up. So um, what we'll do is we come back. We'll have a quick segment and we'll go into hour two. Uh, and I want to spend a little time he here in the the final segment coming up and then going into the the second hour. Uh, back, I just want to rewind a little bit to Sandy Hook because I know that you did have some repercussions so when we come back on the other side of the break i want to get into uh... some of the repercussions uh... you know whatever however insignificant that you know you you might uh... think they are uh... i you know any you know i think any repercussion uh... is telling for you know free speech do we still live in america anymore so we'll get into that on the other side ladies and gentlemen don't go anywhere more with professor james tracy again he's hanging out for an extra half hour tonight with us ladies and gentlemen until eleven thirty so don't go anywhere all right ladies and gentlemen we are back so going into break i said that professor tracy had received um, that there were some repercussions uh, from him speaking out on again his own personal time on his own personal blog as a free uh, American citizen. Uh, last time I checked, again, First Amendment, freedom of speech. Uh, but I, 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 I guess I, I keep forgetting that we live in bizarro world where this is actually the USSA uh, and America with a K, uh, not the America that I grew up in, or I'm sure Professor Tracy uh, remembers growing up in as well. So. Professor, what repercussions did you receive, uh, if any, from speaking out, you know, on your own personal time, on your own personal blog, about the weirdness that you saw surrounding Sandy Hook? 
Well, I um, I was counseled. I had a meeting with the uh, with some administrators at uh, at my university uh, in the in mid January. It was January eighteenth, and um, uh, they had um, expressed the uh, various types of. Um, uh, things that the university had experienced in terms of complaints and uh, I guess families, some of whom withdrew uh, their children's application for admission. Uh, there was a, a donor in a department in my college, which is in, in the College of Arts and Letters, who withdrew a, um, I believe, some sort of a donation, which was non-monetary. It was something other than that. And uh, <clears throat> how there were concerns with regard to uh, safety. Uh, there, um, there were some colleagues and uh, a handful of students that, uh, you know, expressed their uh, their own personal concerns uh, with regard to to that and the uh, the nature of my comments and would they possibly uh, cause anyone to come on campus and. Uh, and, uh, and threaten anyone because there were other incidents unrelated to that at around that time or you know a month or two prior uh, that um, that did take place so you know something like uh, like Newtown like Sandy Hook it, it makes a lot of people really you know spooked about uh, about what could possibly take place and so even talking about it uh, is uh, is something that they kind of link to this potential danger. So anyway, we talked uh, in um, in January, and then I was issued a letter uh, which summarized the uh, our conversation. A number of things were inaccurate in the letter. Uh, so I, um, along alongside the council of um, representatives with the faculty union, who have been wonderful. Uh, I uh, produced a letter one week later correcting them uh, with some of the things that they had stated that, again, were not factual, uh, not correct. Uh, in some cases, were kind of stretching the truth or what I said or misconstruing it. And uh, and then I didn't hear anything back, and that was the first week of February. And um, there were a few uh, folks, you know, that came forward and, uh, and sent letters of support on, for me uh, to the... Uh, to the administration and uh, cc'd me, and uh, I, I posted those letters to uh, to my blog, and they you know they said they said the name of my university of FAU, and uh, so they after a couple of those letters, one of whom was by uh, by Jim Fetzer, uh, and it was a wonderful letter uh, at, where where he was defending my right to be able to investigate this since it is part of uh, what I'm trained to do, you know, media studies and political communication. And uh, so they, um, they issued a letter of reprimand on March 28th. And this has been written up. It, it was discussed in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Ed and Inside Higher Education, the sort of trade publications for academe and, um, in early, early to mid-April. And uh, and so that that's something that I you know I present I gave to my uh, to to the union and uh, and what have you and uh, we uh, are presently involved in a uh, what is referred to as a grievance, which is which is an extrajudicial um, um, process whereby there is a uh, an arbitration. It's something that is in lieu of actual legal action, uh, and uh, and so uh, it, it um, what, what the union is asking is that letter of reprimand uh, be removed from my personnel file uh, because it's unjust, because I have a disclaimer on the website, and uh, it's an infringement of uh, academic freedom and uh, my uh, constitutional rights uh, as well. Uh, and First Amendment rights of free speech. I agree. It's a complete violation of your First Amendment right to free speech to punish you for speaking out on your own time, not not in the format of a professor teaching his class, but in his own private time and being punished for it. That's not the First Amendment, and that's not the country 
I grew up in, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's not the same country that Professor Tracy grew up in. Jim, stay right there, because we got a quick, short break, and then hour two will come up. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. Professor Tracy's going to stay with us for an extra half hour. We will be right back. One minute. Don't go anywhere. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with our number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye from FederalJack.com. It is May 7th, 2013, and tonight, for the next half hour, I am joined by my guest from our number one, Professor James Tracy. If you do not know who he is, I suggest you go back in the archives when you get a chance and listen to the first hour. Uh, and really quick, because I know we're picking up um, you know, new listeners here uh, in the second hour that might be tuning in because uh, they, they, they might have missed the first hour. Uh, going into the break, Professor Tracy was discussing the, uh, the ramifications of things he's gone through. So, uh, Professor, we have about three minutes because this is a really quick segment, and then we have a you know, nice long one. But go ahead and just reiterate uh, really quick, uh, you know, sum up in a nutshell, uh, what you were, uh, what you were getting into, and what you were, you know, when you got cut off, and then in the the next segment, uh, I want to pick your brain about a few other things. So go right ahead. I'll give you the floor until we go to break. Well, the um, the university does not appreciate. Uh, it's rather obvious that they do not appreciate the content of what I am uh, what I am discussing with, for example, uh, the new town. And, uh, and and now Boston, and so they issued a letter of reprimand, as, as I previously said, in March, and uh, the uh, the faculty union and myself, and they're doing this on my behalf, are contesting that, and uh, we have a what is referred to as a grievance uh, that has um, that has been uh, filed, and uh, and then you know this is an extrajudicial judicial process. Uh, and uh, hopefully will be resolved within the course of uh, several weeks. And um, along along those lines, another organization, another faculty union, the American Association of University Professors, has also issued a, a letter to the president of the university, uh, asserting that this is a violation of uh, academic freedom, of free speech, for all faculty at my university and throughout the nation. And that uh, that the administration should come out and uh, and and avow assert that academic freedom and freedom of speech are assured for all of us uh, all of us at, at this particular university. Uh, I I know <clears throat> I know that um, a lot of this is you know behind the scenes you know uh, college politics and all that stuff. But is there anything that uh, the, my listeners or anybody that hears the broadcast later on, you know, in the coming weeks, uh, you know, maybe someone passes it along to them. Is there any anything that they can do? Because I know there's a lot of people that are going to want to help out. So, and can they write letters? Is there somebody they can write letters to? Would that help out or not even bother? Well, if they wish, they could probably contact me uh, through my uh, my website, memoryholeblog.com. And uh, we could, you know, I, I could speak to them uh, and uh, suggest uh, what they what they might wish to do. Uh, yeah, submitting a, a letter uh, would be would certainly be helpful. Uh, that certainly couldn't hurt. Uh, and uh, that's that's one way to uh, to assist. Um, and um, you know, I'll have to uh, I'll have to give that further further thought. But that that show of support <laughs> simply. Uh, you know, a, a, an email, a show of support in that regard is always uh, very much appreciated. Well, what we'll do is before the end of the broadcast, because we got the, the end of the quick segment coming up here, but we got a nice long one, like I said, coming up. So I'm going to have you give out your email and stuff so people can get in contact with you uh, just to show you any type of support that they can, because you deserve it. You really do. Uh, and this is an attack on free speech, and it's a scare. It's to scare off others. So we'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go anywhere. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Nice long segment. So, if you missed it in the the quick, short first segment, there I, I asked Professor Tracy if there's any way that we could get in touch with him, um, him or whoever and show some support. And uh, you know, he he made a good point. The best way to be would email him, and then he can direct you uh, once he sits down and thinks about it. Because I kind of hit him out of left field with this. Uh, but I, I think that if I know there's a lot of professionals that listen to the broadcast. I know you guys are out there because you email me from time to time. Uh, I think if uh, you could email 
Professor Tracy, and I'll, I'll have him give out his email address in a second. Uh, email him, and then you know he, you can get in contact with him and figure out uh, exactly what you want to write or whatever if you want to help out. Uh, but if you are a professional, I mean, even if you're whatever, I mean, anybody can email him. But if you're a um, if you're a you know a doctor or a lawyer or uh, so, some sort of you know so, something some sort of uh, profession that has that label that can that he could throw a little you know throw a little weight behind him that those are the people I urge to have the courage to stand up not just the average people because I know those people already have the courage to stand up they do all the time. You know, they're like the, it's like the difference between the enlisted and the, the officers in the military. The enlisted always stand up. Well, we need we need the higher ranking people, the people that do have jobs like Professor Tracy, it, stand up and back him up. If you're a professor out there, if you're a teacher, anything. So I urge you, you know, if you listen to me and uh, you know uh, you, and you don't do anything else all year long, support Professor Tracy. Professor, how can they get in touch with you uh, to maybe get this going in one way, shape, or form? Uh, my email is memoryholeblog at hushmail.com. That's memoryholeblog, all one word, at hushmail.com. And uh, they can also go through the contact page on memoryholeblog.com. Uh, they can do a search as well for my name and memoryhole or, you know, James Tracy and blog, and they can fairly easily. Uh, find that, and I encourage them to uh, to look at the website and look at the material. They, you know, if they believe that it's worthwhile, uh, and uh, you know that someone should uh, be be defended to be able to speak out on uh, such matters of public interest on their own time, uh, and uh, and wish to support me, then uh, I I you know be more than happy to uh, to receive uh, a word from them and and to receive their support. Uh, I'll tell you something that an old World War II veteran friend of mine, uh, he used to be part of a B-17 bomber crew, and uh, he, he, he likes to throw this term around, um, and it's something I picked up a long time ago from him. You get the most flack when you're over the target, so you must have said something that hit a nerve, or else why even bother to focus on you? That's it, right. Yeah. It's not like they made a story, like a, a, a story out of a non-story, and then ran with it for three days. Usually, when they make a non-story out of something, it runs for a day at the most, maybe a day and a half, and it's done. You know, they tried to ride you like a show pony, Professor. I mean, to put it bluntly, and so that shows that you must have pissed them off in one way, shape, or form. <laughs> I would guess so. My father uh, was in a B twenty four, and uh, I've heard that expression in in, in so many words uh, as well. Uh, and back in January, it uh, lasted, I believe, for a total of, let's see, from January 7th until um, January 16th. And then uh, suddenly they fell silence and the news cycle moved on to Monte Teo and his uh, hoax girlfriend, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the defensive uh, player for, uh, the, the, for the Notre Dame football team, if you, if you recall. Uh, and there were a number of other things as well. There was Lance Armstrong's, uh, you know, use of, I believe, use of, of uh, performance-enhancing drugs. But there was this theme of hoaxes that became prevalent in the major media uh, at around the time that uh, the limelight suddenly, you know, moved away from me. And I'm wondering if there was anyone there, one, you know, uh, thinking to themselves, wow, you know. Uh, will, will the public perhaps catch on about some of the superficial things about the uh, the new town coverage? Uh, you know, given these uh, these these types of uh, things, the, the ways in which people are being being uh, fooled uh, in other sorts of uh, avenues and in and, and, and other ways, you know, in sports and and, uh, and the like by by the media, will they think that it's all artifice? Um, maybe we shouldn't give this guy that much attention. I've talked with. With other individuals as well, and they've suggested well, uh, who, who've been in, in, in similar sorts of situations uh, and been scrutinized, and they've suggested to me, well, maybe, maybe there there was a good deal about your argument that was quite credible, and they didn't want to give it any more attention. You know, it could have been that as well. So, uh, and that's that's what I would uh, I would say it is because you brought up <clears throat> some big red flags, and I think if they kept harping on it too much. 
that would cause people to at least go look at it. Whether or not they believed it, people could go look at it, and there is always that chance that somebody could look at it and go, wow, what the, are you kidding me? You know what I mean? So they don't even want that. They'd rather people go look at Dancing with the Stars. Sure, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that's the case. Also, at that time, you'll recall that the uh, this was an underlying theme of, of the whole the whole event was the uh, the, the gun control measures that uh, the Obama administration and Democrats in Congress were seeking to uh, you know to promote and to push through and uh, if if this particular uh, event at uh, Sandy Hook was uh, somehow revealed as being a hoax uh, then uh, then those those sorts of endeavors, uh, those projects would largely have been dashed. I I to I wholeheartedly agree. I one hundred and ten percent agree, and that's why I, I think I really think it backfired on them. Them attacking you. I mean, I, it wasn't just me who ripped into them. I mean, I I, I my, I'd like to pat myself on the back for that broadcast because I did it pretty eloquently. But I I destroyed their whole at least Cooper's argument of you. But there were others as well that. If they didn't tear it apart like I did, they at least wrote articles saying, come on, this is garbage. And there were so many people in this independent genre that pointed out the, the, the blatant fallacies in their argument that people started to go, hmm, I wonder why they're going after this guy. Yeah, Maybe I should go check his website out. Oh, act, a absolutely. I had a number of people contacting me and, and saying, you know, uh, I, I, was, I really didn't think twice about... Uh, the, uh, the the possible problems with the Sandy Hook narrative until I heard and saw Anderson Cooper attack you, and he did so so viciously. I figured there must be some truth in what you're saying. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think it did backfire in a number of ways. I mean, it was very uh, it was very vehement. It was uh, it was really really uh, brutal, uh, especially early on. These were smears. I mean, calling someone a conspiracy theorist. If you're a journalist, if you're an intellectual, if you're an academic, I mean, that's the kiss of death, you know. Uh, and um, that's one of the reasons most people really don't look into subject matter that is controversial in this sort of way, especially academics, you know. We've got the guarantee of due process. We have the guarantee of tenure. And if we're not asking these sorts of questions, who will? Well, well as I said in... <clears throat> my throat is so screwed up tonight. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. As I said in... Um, their my uh, debunking of their hit piece on you. You didn't ask anybody to, uh, you know, buy or drink Kool Aid. You didn't ask anybody to convert to a different religion. All you did was say, "Hey, here's some information. Think outside the box." That's all you've ever done since I've known you, Professor. Otherwise, I wouldn't back you. Okay, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. I, you, you've always been a straightforward guy. As long as I've known you, I've broke bread with you, I know you as a real person. So when I saw their attack on you, I mean, I already saw through it, but I know people that had the same epiphany. They were like, mm, you know, I don't know. And then they saw you get attacked, and they were like, oh, wow. Wow, there's got to be some credibility here. <laughs> and then they, they looked into certain things. And even if they don't buy everything, or and I'm not saying that you're selling anything, but even if they don't believe everything that you've, all the evidence that you've you know, brought to bear and say, look, this needs to at least be looked at. Even if they don't, they only believe 50% of it. That's 50% more evidence than they're being brought by Anderson Cooper, MSNBC, or anybody else. It's that mm -hmm. simple. And by the way, you were smart for not going on that broadcast because if you had, they would have tried to make a spectacle out of it and then it would have been passed on to MSNBC. And of course, you probably would have gotten a chance to maybe talk to Dirtbag O'Reilly. Well, for about three seconds before you, because you would have said, well, Bill, and then they would have cut your mic. Because <laughs> you know how O'Reilly works. So you were smart. And again, ladies and gentlemen, it, see, Professor Tracy is a professor who specializes in the media, right? Uh, we'll say, and he knew not to play their game. And and you're I again I think they stretched it out as long as they could, but because you wouldn't bite back, they lost interest after a certain point. They're like, all right, forget it. You know, this guy wants nothing to do with us. So moving on to the next distraction. 
Yeah. Well, I did, um, after they had badgered me for about a week or so, I finally did say, well, okay, I'll go on, but I do want to go on live. I don't want to go on uh, taped uh, in such in such a way that you can really sort of jumble things around and, and have me saying things that I didn't say and put me in a negative light. I'd, I'd like to be live with, with Cooper, and uh, they never responded. Again, you called them out <laughs> on their game because yes. they wanted to do, they would want to sit down with you, uh, you know, and like, perfect example is the local piece that they did on you. They caught you coming out of your, uh, one of your class, uh, one of the classrooms, uh, and it happened to be after a late class that you were teaching. So you're coming out of the classroom, you, you know, you've been up working all day. And you threw your bag over your shoulder, and they, they were already, you know, you, I know they were already hanging out, kind of annoying you, but they, they, wa they waited to get up in your face pretty much until right at the very end, and then instead of, you know, what, like five or ten minutes worth of video and audio that they, you know that they got, they use a ten-second snippet to make you look like a crazy person, and, and the media does this time and time again, and after a while, people realize this, and they catch on, and they're going to go, you know what? I, uh, you lose credibility, and it, look. Even without me doing my the broadcast where I tore the Cooper's argument apart, or you know the hundreds of other people doing uh, you know articles and stuff that tore apart that argument and in your defense and, and other videos that people did, uh, th this stuff is falling apart. And they, your their attack on you was so transparent, Professor. It was just anybody with half a brain looks at it and goes. Why are they going after this guy? I mean, all he did was go on a blog. I mean, aren't these the same people that would bitch if George Bush were in power right now? Going after them for, uh, you know, perhaps attacking one of his policies or something? They, yeah, you know, they would, and if he was going after their free speech, and now they're going after you with that same, uh, you know, vitriolic fervor. So that makes one go, hmm. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't take a, uh, a great deal to actually um, think about, to interrogate, to piece apart this whole term uh, conspiracy theorist as well. I mean, what do we actually mean? What does that mean? Well, that suggests that someone actually is capable of, of, of critical thought and uh, has an idea of, uh, of how political and social economic power actually work. Uh, and how you know uh, government uh, uh, and corporations uh, act really against the people's interests. Um, I think that's a fairly viable definition of uh, what a conspiracy theorist uh, is. Uh, and to not be one is essentially to, I guess, be impressionable, naive, and accept just about everything that is um, that is passed along to us. Uh, and so, you know, it's uh, I, I, you know, we, th it's a fairly recent term as well. If you really kind of consider the etymology of it, it's only come around, come about, uh, and, um, and and increased in prevalence since uh, Oklahoma City in 1995, and, uh, and and thereafter, largely, you know, through the the left and the progressive community. Uh, in books about the so-called radical right and, uh, and and what have you, but prior to that, and you'll appreciate this as you know very well, uh, you know, uh, Jim, I'm going to cut you off right there because sure. we're coming up to a break. But I want to okay. I want you to finish that thought when we come back. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We will be right back with Professor James Tracy. Stay tuned. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We are dealing with sick, very sick, satanic individuals at the core of this thing that have some beliefs that maybe you might not believe in but they do and that's what by the way that bumper means when you hear doing the two-step with lucifer we all are and we all are walking the fine line i guess at least in their eyes between einstein and charles manson between genius and insanity right when you start to research this stuff now professor tracy brought up a really good point in the last segment and he got cut off by the break and he was talking about conspiracy theories and stuff and we were we were talking during the break. And by the way, before I forget, I want to give him a big uh, shout-out because he's going to stay on till the end of the broadcast with us until midnight. So, awesome. So, thank you, Professor Tracy. I appreciate it. And oh, you're most welcome. Well. Um, let, let, let me get back into that what you that point you were bringing up because it's really important. I know we talked about it already during the break, but it's, it's really important that we, we hammer this since we have the, the extra few minutes now. Conspiracy theory 
as a pejorative, you you brought up a really good point. And it, you know, I was saying how to you during the break how, you know, it it, it had been uh, used you know as a, a negative pejorative label uh, since the Kennedy assassination. Even though the term is old, or it does actually originate like date back to in written form to like the late eighteen hundreds, it wasn't used like it is today. Uh, as a pejorative label until the, the late 60s, uh, and you had brought up the, the, the CIA memo. Uh, but you, you really did make a good point how it was really ramped up after the 90s, especially during the Clinton administration, and then you see the attack on Bill Cooper, uh, you know, as the most dangerous man on the airwaves. Clinton called him at one point. Uh, so, that, I mean, this all goes together. So go ahead and uh, please finish your point. We have about uh, three and a half minutes before we go uh, through this sh- short segment, and we'll have a nice nice long one. Uh, but go ahead, finish your point. Well, I was going to uh, going to say that the term it, it is true that the term um, it you know can be traced uh, in its more modern usage to the 1960s. Uh, if, you, if you look at a very famous essay by the the Columbia University historian Richard Hofstetter, the paranoid style of American politics. Uh, had in mind uh, the John Birch Society, the Goldwater uh, Republicans, and uh, in early to mid 1960s, one of the things that they were questioning was the Kennedy assassination, uh, quite quite rightly, and the uncertain sorts of conditions around that. And then, of course, there is the um, the CIA memo. I believe CIA memo 1146 that was uh, released in 1977 as a result of the New York Times. Um, FOIA request that uh, discusses a very uh, specific uh, methodology about uh, silencing uh, public figures, uh, journalists, commentators, academics, in their questioning of the Warren Commission report, which they had a very clear investment in, having contributed to it in in, in various ways. The fact that uh, uh, Alan Dulles was on the uh, on, on the Warren Commission it's, itself. Um, so there are there are those uh, you know those that that sort of background, but uh, it it really comes back and is used uh, much more prevalently in the mid to late 1990s, and specifically following the Oklahoma City bombing. It's something that's used uh, you know in conjunction with uh, Timothy McVeigh, uh, the fact that he had this. Uh, allegedly dark ideology, you know the Turner Diaries. It's all, it's all intertwined with, um, oh the uh, uh, the right wing movement, uh, white supremacy. I mean these are the sorts of tales and the mythologies that are that are the uh, the products of the SPLC and ADL to a significant degree. I mean very powerful uh, propaganda uh, outlets. Uh, so you know it, it's it's developed this resonance in the public mind is uh, and it has very negative connotations. So the idea of being called that is uh, something that is uh, arguably it's you know uh, potentially the end of one's career. Uh, <laughs> just a couple of weeks ago, one of the a, a handful of professors from uh, uh, from my university sent a letter to the local papers here <clears throat> arguing that I resign because I, uh, I'm a conspiracy theorist and uh, again they don't really take that apart. I, I would think that intellectuals or academics would take the, the term apart and explain its meaning if they're going to call me that uh, but uh, they uh, believe that that somehow interferes with my ability to be able to function as an intellectual, to be able to function as an instructor, uh, as, a, uh, as a scholar. A very slipshot argument, in my view, but you know it, it's something that is um, uh, that that is used to this day. That's an ad hominem fallacy, is what that is. Sure. They're, they're yeah. trying to it's to the man. They're trying to attack you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to cut us off, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go anywhere. When we get back, nice long segment with Professor Tracy. Stay tuned. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. Nice long segment with Professor Tracy and Jim. Going to break. We were talking about how. You know, anytime, especially like when you bring stuff up, or uh, Professor Fetzer, you mentioned him earlier, uh, Kevin Barrett, a- any anybody in academia, uh, you know, in your position, uh, your job title, whatever, whatever anybody wants to call it, uh, when you when you guys step up to the plate, if you uh, get interviewed by somebody or 
um, one of these talking heads will say O'Reilly because he's done this type of stuff with Kevin Barrett before, and you experienced this with uh, another talking head who said you shouldn't be teaching. Uh, it, they say that because you guys think outside the box, you shouldn't be teaching kids. Uh, um, last time I checked, that's the kind of person you want teaching your kid is to think outside the box. Ladies and gentlemen, let me make this clear. I said this to Professor Tracy off air. If I had children and they were in college, I would urge them, if they were you know, anywhere near where he taught and they went to school there, I would urge them to take his classes. I would urge them to keep in contact with him and talk to him about whatever. I would, and I would ask him if he didn't mind if they ever needed uh, any mentoring on a professor level, even if they were at uh, some other university, to contact them and talk to them because he is an excellent professor. Okay? Hands down, bar none, one of the best professors there is. Do you want to know why? I'll tell you why. Not because I've broke bread with him, not because I know him, because I've seen him teach. I've seen his style. And he teaches people to think for themselves. That's why. And that's why I said that about you, Professor Tracy. And that's why I wanted to sidetrack you know, the, the, everything for a second and get that out there because it's important that people know that. Because we need more people like you who have the courage to teach their students to think outside the box rather than to drink the Kool-Aid and just go along to get along, because that's not going to get us anywhere. Well, thank you very much for those uh, kind words, Bob. Uh, you know, I, I think that there is this common misconception among the broader public of what a professor does. I think there is, in part, the belief that a professor somehow behaves in class like an Anderson Cooper or a Sean Hannity or a Bill O'Reilly or a Rachel Maddow might actually act in front of the camera, you know, providing uh, a bit of analysis but a whole lot of opinion. And uh, and of course that's not the case at all. It's you know that's far from what we actually uh, actually do. And I would not want to uh, instill or imprint a particular opinion. Uh, uh, on uh, on any of the uh, the students, but rather to give them a, a, a variety of perspectives uh, and and ideas that they might not be exposed to otherwise on the beaten track, and to decide for themselves. Uh, and and so the idea that uh, well someone shouldn't be teaching because they say this outside of the classroom is completely anathema to uh, what we would expect for. Um, Public figures or anyone else to uh, to utter, uh, you know, out loud in a, in a free society, uh, and you know it's 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 very unfortunate. But again, I think that I think that um, there are a um, there's a, there's a, a common notion that um, that professors uh, make students believe something. And, you know, uh, most, uh, you know, students, a great many of them in their late teens, early 20s, are too savvy. They're too, uh, they're too sharp for that. And uh, at the same time, they, uh, they can understand and latch on to something that they, they do recognize as having some uh, degree of inherent value. Uh, and that includes, like, you know, d different sorts of ways of looking at the media, uh, different sorts of ways of looking at our, um, our history. Uh, and uh, and events that might not actually seem as if they as if they have been um, have been imparted uh, either through our formal schooling process or through the media, which is you know a, a principal means of uh, of, of uh, extended uh, you know um, education. So um, so yeah, they're not really. I don't think students are given enough credit when I do tell them or suggest. Uh, you know, we mentioned people, for example, like David Horowitz, who I, I don't know if you're familiar with or not, uh, who, uh, you know, wants to have a, uh, uh, a student's uh, Bill of Rights or the equivalent uh, because there are what he believes to be too many left-wing professors in the academy, too many radical professors in the academy. Well, you know, I wish that that were, in fact, the case. I don't believe that it is, uh, but uh, if, if that... Since he believes that, uh, he wants for uh, students to somehow be protected uh, from uh, any sorts of uh, any type of uh, uh, of perspective that might challenge their their view uh, and 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 the like. When I try to describe that to to students, they're really taken aback. 
<laughs> the idea that there's someone who believes that we're this impressionable actually exists is uh, it, it is really something in and of itself. Uh, you know, most most people today, uh, at least the younger generation now, and it's it's largely in part to what you see Charlotte Izzard be talking about. Uh, you know, that generation that was younger when when this was being implemented. Uh, it, you know, they started it when I was in school, but it's the younger generations that it was really focused on. The, the kids that were like, you know, I'd say. Uh, it, not even one to two years, but like three to five behind me at, at the very least is really where they, they knuckled down and started to focus on it. And now it's workforce training. So these kids come out, no critical thinking skills whatsoever. So even if they do go to college because their parents can afford to send them to college uh, for, or they somehow get a scholarship or whatever, uh, th they're already there's no critical thinking. And then they go to the university and there's a lot of these... Uh, I, you could say left wing, but again, there's. I know there really isn't left or right. You know what I mean? Uh, most of these teachers, these, these professors that people would say are the radical lefties, crazy lefties. A lot of them they have ties to the Central Intelligence Agency, and the CIA makes no bones about the fact that they infiltrated universities a very long time ago. So, whether or not it's someone they know that is a handler or they have direct ties, it does not matter if you trace a lot of these. Provo the, the, not the not the pro provocative ones in a good way. I mean the ones that would uh, incite bad things or in try to incite the type of thinking uh, that the powers that shouldn't be would want. You know that uh, that that you know that the whole the whole idea. I went off on Facebook about this, by the way, earlier today. The whole idea. Uh, the people there, I see a lot of well-intentioned people going, "Oh, communism is good." Well, socialism is good. Well, what you're being sold as communism, Fabian socialism, uh, is not what you think it is. Uh, Marxism, none of it is. That it, it all that all goes back to Weishaupt's writings and all of that stuff. Uh, I, and I know a, a lot of times that gets glorified. And there, there, there is uh, yes, the, the, you can look at it and you can learn different things from different philosophies. And that's not what I'm saying. And I don't want to get too sidetracked in it. But uh, I, I find that there's a certain uh, with these professors that have these younger kids' ears. There's a certain um, a party line that they tow, and it always connects to this larger agenda. You know what I mean? This this illuminist agenda. Not, I, I, and I'm not talking about the, if people think there there could be some sort of utopia where we could all get along. That would be great. I'm I'm talking about the reality of what these people are really doing, and that's why you see these events going on. And when you see people that actually buy into this, it's because of this dumbing down and this appeal to authority, and that yes, we need we need bigger government, and we need this type. You know, like uh, what's his name said, uh, Jefferson. Any government big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take it all away. So, sure. And I know that's a, a lot to uh, chew on, but what say you, Professor? Well, yeah, I, you know, a lot of these, um, uh, what, you, what you bring up, uh, the hidden history of uh, the origins of, uh, you know, socialist thought, uh, of, uh, of Marxism, these things are not, <laughs> they're not even really brought up for, uh, for consideration. In um, you know, in in the classroom or anything of the like, uh, so those things are bracketed off. So what we get in many cases is a kind of romanticized version of um, of, uh, of Marx, of, uh, of socialism, and the like. Um, you know, those on the left uh, generally. Uh, look at government as being a good thing. They look at government uh, in a very favorable sort of way, even if it's a police state, you know? I mean, look at what happened at Boston, for example. We had 10,000 militarized police on the streets going after a 19-year-old. There should have been, uh, who, who, who was likely innocent, um, there should have been a public outcry uh, for something like this. It's unprecedented. Um, but uh, we don't have that. Uh, there's this notion that uh, Obama and his administration are somehow, you know, uh, gentle rulers or the equivalent, I guess, because of their progressive left uh, penumbra uh, <laughs> perception that they are 
of you know um, uh, good uh, and and the like. I think among a certain segment of the population, and um, so yeah, th those on the left they they will not critique government, uh, and because they really ultimately want to use it uh, for um, certain purposes that they have in mind, right? Uh, for uh, greater forms of regulation. And I could see to some degree, for example, curbing corporate power. Uh, that would be a good thing, but it is the way that government is set up today uh, is that it, it abets and reinforces uh, that uh, that corporate power. You know, you take the regulatory agencies, which are accountable to no one, um, and they generally do the bidding of the pharmaceutical uh, industry or agriculture or what have you. And yet still, um, you know, and, and I, I was kind of, <laughs> um, my mentors in grad school and uh, colleagues and the like are generally left of center, generally, you know, socialist. And uh, I think that I've had that mindset up until, you know, fairly recently. And there is no real critique uh, or the equivalent of of govern, government and regulatory bodies as there arguably should be, and the challenges that they pose uh, for um, for a free society. No, instead there's faux critique of people like you who, uh, in their own free time, speak out, uh, even though you're a professional uh, and you uh, in academia and you have the courage to speak out, and then they try to skewer you and get you fired or, or punished for you know via your job, even though it wasn't connected to what you had to say. And all, again, all you did ever did was open your mouth and say, "Hey, this is what's up." Again, in your own free time, and instead of actually trying to have a debate with you or trying to have a uh, a, a rational argument whether or not you don't have to agree with professor tracy but try to if you're gonna take them on how about doing so in a logical debate rather than a uh, logical fallacy filled argument which in this case it's it's a straw man argument um, filled with ad hominem attacks basically because that's what it is it's always to the man it's or you obviously are too crazy to be teaching kids well that's that, that's that's not even part of the argument. You're not even debating him on what the evidence that he's bringing forth. That's what it is. See, they make it about you and not about what you're talking about, and that shifts focus, and that's all their job is. That People have to look at these talking heads that do quote-unquote interviews, and I'm doing air quotes when I say that, and I, I reporters, I use that term very loosely with these people. Okay, look at them like a railroad switchman. And there, you know, Professor Tracy say he comes on and he's got a, a logical, valid argument, and he's on track A. Well, you're good. The, the trains, you're the you're the train. You're headed towards track A, towards his logical argument. Well, they can't have that. So what they do is they have the switchman, the the repeater. He switches the track to B, which is his logical fallacy filled argument, the straw man argument, based off of ad hominem fallacies, to the man attacking Professor Tracy or anybody else that dares bring forth any information. Oh, they must be crazy conspiracy theorists. <laughs> it's so see-through and transparent, Professor. It really is pathetic once you have even the most basic understanding of all this. I'm going to cut us off because we have the final break coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We will be back for the final segment with tonight's guest, Professor James Tracy. When we come back, I'm going to have him plug his blog, so don't go anywhere. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Final segment for tonight's broadcast. I want to thank my guest before we, uh, before I, I get his final thoughts on things. I want to thank you, Professor Tracy, for doing an extra hour. I know we had originally only scheduled uh, from 10 p.m. to 11, and um, I know throughout the broadcast during the breaks, I, I coaxed you into staying for uh, an extra hour. So I want to thank you so much for giving me up an extra hour of your night tonight, sir. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Uh, my pleasure. Um, so. Uh, the last uh, we got about five minutes here. I want to I want to pick your brain, uh, and then I want you to plug your website first. You know what? I'm going to have you plug it again before uh, you hang up. But go ahead and plug your website really quick, and then I want to ask you something about uh, Boston. So go ahead and plug the website really quick. Yeah, it's uh, memoryholeblog.com, and uh, there's a good deal of information on there. I try to do you know, uh, lately it's been a couple of posts a week, and and. Uh, 
some people have contacted me, and I, I do have a, a small number of, of contributors now uh, as, as well, so guest posts and things like that. But it was originally set up uh, just for you know for my own essays and own material. But uh, uh, since uh, Sandy Hook and Boston, I have had a number of other kinds of, um, of, of posts that I do put up and, and encourage uh, commentary on. I'm very, fairly careful about moderating the comments as well. Certainly it's not a free-for-all, but uh, it, uh, I've got a, a, a good number of, I think, really sharp uh, uh, readers and commenters. I'm very happy about that. Uh, I, I like your blog. I, th I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's worth the time to go check it out. At, at the very least, take five minutes. I guarantee you, once you go to the website, I don't even have to sell it. Once you go to the website, there's no flashiness. I love it. A site, it's very simple. It's to the point. That's what I like about Professor Tracy. Um, again, one more time, I tell them how they can get in contact with you. By the way, uh, if they want to help you, because we got a few minutes, so go ahead and take it to tell them how you know the contact form or email or whatever. Well, there's a contact form on memoryholeblog.com, and uh, that's fairly easily accessible from the main page. And also, the email is there. That's memoryholeblog at hushmail.com, memoryholeblog at hushmail.com, uh, and that's available on the website as well. So either way, uh, folks can get in touch with me, and I'll, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Awesome. All right, Professor, we got about uh, three minutes. So in the last three minutes, I want to just pick your brain really quick on one final Boston question. I know there's a, a ton of red fla flags and everything else. Um, you've written a couple articles on uh, the Boston bombing, correct? The Boston Marathon bombing? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are the titles of the three articles, or however many articles? I, I, I don't remember exactly the number, but what are the, the titles of the articles uh, specifically focused on the Boston bombing because, again, I respect your opinion uh, and your take on things, and I think that I, well, I don't think I know the readers uh, of uh, Federal Jack and the listeners to my show uh, respect your opinion. So, what are the title of the articles specifically uh, for uh, the Boston Marathon bombing? Because then that way they can look them up and it'd be easier for them to find. Because I want people to check out what you have to say. Well, uh, I think the one that's probably gotten the most circulation is uh, called uh, Witnessing Boston's Mass Casualty Event, and uh, that was also on Global Research, uh, and that was uh, published on April 22nd. And then there's another one that I wrote on um, Carlos Arredondo, who was the, um, you know, the Boston's uh, cowboy had a hero, uh, called The Unlikely Antics of Boston's Cowboy Hero. Uh, and that came out on the 26th. And then there are a number of other posts as well that are not necessarily essays. For example, I put something up about a week ago uh, uh, on th that's called the Homeland Security uh, Exercise Evaluation Program Actor Information Sheet and Waiver Form that's well worth checking out because there is a uh, uh, an actor sheet and uh, and and uh, and, and disclaimer uh, that uh, crisis actors sign uh, sign off on before they participate in one of these mass casualty events. And that's that's worth checking out. Uh, also, um, I, I put up some guest posts as well that I thought were quite compelling and, and worthy of uh, worthy of consideration by by viewers. Excuse me, uh, readers. Uh, there's something I put out this weekend, Anomalies Emerge in Photos of Second Bomb Site. That was actually uh, something that was submitted as a lengthy comment. And I asked the commenter if we could make it into a, an actual post, and she agreed, and so that's up there uh, as well. So there are several uh, having to do with Boston, and um, I hope that they do try to shed some light on this very, very uh, questionable event. That's awesome. Uh, Professor... I want to thank you, sir, for taking two hours of your night tonight uh, to come on. I know you are a very busy man, uh, and I know you have a family that you take care of as well. Uh, I, I know not only myself, but the listeners appreciate everything that you do, sir. So thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart, not, not, you know, not, not just as a radio broadcaster, but as a free uh, individual. Thank you, sir, for what you do, and thank you for teaching the future uh, to think outside the box. Well, thank you, Popeye. It's uh, once again great to be here, and I'm happy to be on the program. Well, you're welcome back whenever you want to come back. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. 
Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Remember, be autodidacts. Think outside the box. And give Professor Tracy any support you can. Professionals out there, you know who you are. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll catch you all tomorrow night. Love you all. We're out of here.